coming to you from the Star City. This is Scarlet Fever, a daily Nebraskan production. Hi, happy Monday. It's a great day outside. It's beautiful. There's it some is. clouds. It's a very nice day. Happy oh. Monday. It is cold. It is not cold. It's cold. You are the cold. only person that is cold right now. I'm not cold. I don't even have a jacket on. Right now. There's three people in the room. Uh, it's Danny, Ben, and Emma. Hello, everybody. Hello. We're all back. Uh, we're off of the bye week, but there was a lot going on. Uh, I, for one, was very sad about the college game day tribute to Ben Herb Street. I was not expecting to be crying at 10 in the morning on yeah, Saturday. His dog, yeah. That, that was sad. That was then, very sad. Then, like, he was supposed to, like, open the tribute, and he couldn't even, like, talk because he was crying. That's so sad. Like, he couldn't even, you know. It was really a full circle moment because of just how much Lee Corso's health has been deteriorating over the last three years. Yeah. And then that's what makes it even cooler. Lee Corso put his hand mm-hmm. on Herb Street's shoulder. That was a really powerful moment. But it is November 11th. Happy Veterans Day. Think of veteran today. We are streaming it. We are up on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you usually find us. We got a busy day today. There was something that happened earlier today. Something that we've all been clamoring for, especially me, because I hate incompetent people. And something fine, yeah. I I get to I get to watch two Husker games every weekend, pretty much, with Nebraska and the Chicago Bears. But oh, I'm not gonna Nebraska let Nebraska incompetent. N- maybe. Um, all right. Okay. So Shots you, fired. You know. You know it's bad. Okay. You know it's bad. You want to know just how much I'm in sports purgatory? Okay. So I was listening to Chicago Sports Radio this morning. They have a Big Ten Network analyst on talking about the Bears game. And they bring up Nebraska football and start <laughs> comparing them to the Bears. That's that's crazy. That's just how bad it's gotten. <laughs> but crazy. the one thing that Nebraska has on the one-up of the Chicago Bears that I'm actually kind of happy about is that they made a change on their offensive staff. Marcus Satterfield is no longer the offensive coordinator. Tight ends coach. He's still the tight ends coach. Dana Holgerson. Is your new offensive coordinator? What a rise yeah, came in two in, weeks. Yeah, came in. What was was that? Just a week ago, he came in. Something like that. It was yeah. very recent. It was just. A, I'm pretty sure it was like just a week or a week and a half ago he came in. Yeah. But, um, I don't want to say surprising because it's really not that surprising when you saw like when when the news came out that he was coming to be a consultant. The first thing that popped in everyone's head was, is he going to be calling plays? Maybe not initially, but like after, you know, hearing Rule talk about him saying he's an offensive genius and all this stuff. I mean, it just kind of, it, I don't want to say it was obvious, but it was kind of trending in the direction where he's always going to be calling some plays or have some kind of input on play calling. But now he's full go the guy, which isn't surprising, but honestly is the right move. I mean, the, the offense just hasn't been good. I mean, that's, I mean, just to put it, to put it how it is, I mean, they just haven't been good. Now, is this going to be a good shakeup? I mean, we'll see. I, I think the passing attack is definitely going to probably improve. Um, Holgerson's had a um, long history of having good passing attacks. The only thing that concerns me is how much is Nebraska going to invest into the run game? Because that's what you need to do in the Big Ten is invest in the run game. And Holgerson really hasn't done that in the history of his programs. He's had some good running teams. He's had some good running backs, but... It's not his, like, forte, if you know what I mean. Like, that's not his top priority is to get the run game going. And you have to kind of do that in the Big Ten to win. So that's my initial thoughts on it. I mean, you said he's an offensive genius, and that's what Nebraska needs right now. But I think my— Pretty high praise, though. I I, <laughs> I don't I don't know if I would go that far to say he's an offensive genius. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't I mean, know. That's, I didn't say that. You said that. No, I'm, I'm saying Holgerson said— I mean, Yeah, uh, yeah, rule, yeah. Rule I'm, I'm talking that. about rule. But I'm no, not, yeah. yeah, correct. But um, my biggest concern is I'm glad they made a change, but I don't know how much it's going to impact the next three games, like how much can- change can really happen. Um, hopefully it'll we'll see improvements going forward next season if this stays. But I don't know. My concern is just how much can change. Well, it's going to be interesting to see what happens, but – Look what Purdue did after Nebraska beat them <laughs> yeah. at the start of October. They they fired their OC and they went and they scored forty nine points against Illinois the next weekend, almost upset Illinois on the road. But is yeah. that going to happen with Nebraska? Who knows? I mean, sometimes it just takes a new voice in the room to inspire the guys. I mean, 
I don't because I'm not in the locker room, so I have no nope. obviously. Obviously, that's why I'm here. Um, we don't know if Satterfield lost lost the offensive locker room. We we don't know that. I I, prob- I don't I don't think it's that. Probably probably not. But rule recognize that there needs to be a new voice there. I talked about I think it was last week after the UCLA game how rule is a primarily defensive coach. He needs to have a offensive coordinator who can basically serve as the head coach of the offense. And we saw through 20 games that Marcus Satterfield just wasn't it. And I give Rule a lot of credit for, I I, I mean, I didn't think it would accelerate as quickly as it did, but I got to give him credit for coming to the realization that this isn't working, we need to make a change, I want to save my job. So I need to do this. And I think it's a lot of faith to put in Dana Holgerson to try and salvage what's left it is. of 2024. I mean, yeah, they, they they have a history, Rule and Holgerson. Um, I, I'm not going to jump on the boat of like praising Rule for making a change because, I mean, to be fair, this, this is something that just should have been avoided when you first came here. Satterfield was a questionable hire to start with. He's literally never had... A top 50 offense I don't think in the history of his career so it's just interesting hire to start off with and now because you made a change final three games there's like fans praising him and I'm not ready to go that far and rule also said that he hoped now it's not nothing is for certain next year but he would said that he would like Horgerson to also be the OC next year and that's the that's the part that's concerning to me it's not not more concerning more like I just feel like you're if, if you just already lock him in for OC, you're not really leaving your options open to people that could become that could come available in the off season. But maybe maybe this is the guy that Rule wanted before, and he he just didn't want to get rid of Satterfield last time, so like he couldn't bring him onto the staff. And Olsen just wanted to be an offensive coordinator. I don't know. It, it's really hard to get a read on that, but I just really hope this isn't like I want them to leave their options open. For offensive coordinator for next season because I yeah absolutely because I do think now Holgerson is is fine he's fine but there's also a reason he got fired at Houston I mean but, but I'm, I'm just I'm just gonna throw it out there I mean there's a reason why he didn't stick around as a head coach there I'm not saying he's a bad coach at all head coach and coordinator two completely different things Holgerson you can be a really good coordinator but sometimes you just can't lead the ship as a head coach I get that but still I mean Holgerson's not this perfect candidate. And I just want to make sure that they don't just close all their options at offensive coordinator. Because you can't tell me that a guy you can get middle of the season is the best guy that's going to be available in the offseason. Because usually I mean, that's yeah. not how it works. I mean, there's there's probably a reason why no one picked him up. I mean, I mean, I don't know. Maybe he wanted to take the season off, and then when Rule called him up, he was like, sure. I mean, you, you just don't know. I mean, there's just not a lot of information about it. But it's going to be interesting. I mean, I think it's the right move for this season. I'm just not for sure for next season. But we're going to get a feel about, you know, next three games, how it goes to see if he should stick around. Yeah, no, that's what I was going to say. There's still three games left in the 2024 season, and I'm more of a, like, stick by the moment and not look that far ahead in the future. There's still a long time until the 2025 season. So I feel like you just look and see what happens in these next three games. Are there improvements? Do you get that sixth win? Does anything happen? And if not, again, keep looking for other options you don't need to lock it in right now and the bar is also kind of lowered now i mean now now fans are just hoping for six wins mm-hmm. when i mean nine wins was honestly very gettable at the beginning yeah. of the year i mean honestly i mean in all honesty that's I, what we were th- saying this team should start. i mean to be fair with the way the schedule was this team should have gotten eight or nine wins and they still yeah. can't get eight wins i was gonna say i was thinking yeah, we, eight, they still can't get there I, I just i don't know if it, it's very i i, I don't want to say it's unlikely but if I was a betting man, which I'm not. <laughs> and you're bad at betting. I'm not. You don't know that, Danny. I've <laughs> yes, never that, done it. <laughs> but if I was a betting man, I would say that Nebraska gets at most one win. At most. I would say at most one more win. That, I, that, that's yeah. that's where I'm at right now. I it, I think it would honestly be a miracle if they get two wins. Like, I, I would literally say a miracle. Unless the offense just completely like changes. Like and But I just, I'm still of the mindset that Yes, Satterfield was part of the problem of why the offense wasn't performing, but there's also a talent issue on that end. I mean, there's, a, I mean, it's clear. There's not really a running back that's a, that's a game changer. 
The perimeter wide receivers have been struggling. They don't use the tight ends very well. I think the tight end room is actually pretty good. They just don't use tight ends. Yeah, when was the last tight. time we saw Carter Nelson jump off the page of us? No, he hasn't. Sent what? Did he score in the UTEP game or is that the Northern? It was you and I. Yeah, the, you, yeah, Northern Iowa game. Yeah, I I don't know. It, I mean, the tight end room is good. I think. Yes. I mean, I mean, you got you got Fedoni, Borgature, and you got Carter Nelson. Like those are three. I mean, they're not amazing, but like that's a pretty good group. And, it's a solid group. Yeah. And they're just not. I mean, they're just not really producing. No, I've been saying all season. I want to see more out of the tight ends. Like I get that. Like a big job for tight ends is blocking. Damn. But. Like (laughs) coming from like I'm a Chiefs fan and I'm used to just more of like a dynamic tight end who can who also does oh so you want a Travis Kelsey on no I'm not (laughs) necessary but like even Gray like he's good too not to like but like I've I just want more out of the tight ends because it is such a talented room so I do want like I want to see more of them especially when your quarterback is a freshman Mm -hmm. I mean um, uh, they always say a, a freshman quarterback's best friend is a tight end, a really good tight end. I mean, just the safety blanket that you have over the middle. But they just haven't really been using the tight ends over the seam. I mean, they just haven't. I mean, Fedoni's been going – I mean, they've been trying to do some of these tight end screen passes for Fedoni that's been kind of questionable in my opinion. Like, I, I don't get why they have Fedoni going sideline to sideline. He should be going <laughs> – he should be going vertically down the field. Yeah. Uh-huh. Get him get him down the seams. I mean, he, he's, he's – I don't want to say – like. He's kind of a matchup nightmare for, for teams. I mean, I, I got to be honest. He kind of is. I mean, he he's big enough, to, so a corner can't really guard him. And, he, and he's pretty decently fast that a linebacker might not be able to keep up with him. I mean, he's not the matchup, night, like matchup mismatch that other tight ends are in college football. He, I mean, clearly he's not of the elite upper echelon of tight ends. But I think he's a pretty good tight end, better than what he's been doing right now. I mean, I really thought he was going to have a career, a career year this year, and he just— hasn't yet yeah no especially like i've been saying i want or yeah i've been saying i want to see more out of um fedoni because even in the off season they emphasize so much that like riola and fedoni have this connection like i think i was seeing all these videos like during practice of all their catches so i thought he was going to be like a big key player throughout the season and like someone we saw a lot with catches and like receptions but there's just not really been much what I really want to see out of Dana Holgerson is to complement the playbook to the players. Mm-hmm. You have a good tight end room from most of your accounts. The wide receivers have been struggling, but maybe there's something you just have to change there. The screen pass game, something's got to change there. It's identifying where your strengths and weaknesses are with the offensive line, especially your perimeter blocking, which just has not been all that great. It's trying to just like I've been saying, tailor to your players and what you have and not trying to fit the players into a box. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of these players, especially on the offensive side of the ball, saving the quarterback, but your skill players are all relatively experienced. They've all had pretty solid experience. They've, you have a lot of transfers coming in who've been there, done that. So, they have an avenue to do something productive but they're being hindered a little bit and I just really all I want to see is not trying to fit people into a certain category like you have to do this you have to do this what are your strengths what are you good at let's try this let's try this I think we're going to see a lot of experimentation and I mean Holgerson's one piece of the puzzle, and Rule and Rule said this that yes, okay, maybe Satterfield wasn't doing as good of a job as he should have been doing, but at the end of the day, the players are the guys that are going out there. Mm-hmm. I mean, if Satterfield draws up a screen pass and you need to block this guy and you don't block him, is that Satterfield's fault? I mean, maybe you maybe you shouldn't be calling as many screen passes because you know they can't block like that. But at the end of the day, if that's the guy you're supposed to block, go block him. Like, the players need to take some accountability. And, and Rule said that. He's not one to blame the players. But he kind of at the press conference is like, okay, I did my thing. We got Holgerson here. You, time for you guys to kind of hold up your end of the bargain. He didn't say it quite like that. I'm kind of putting words in his mouth. But he, in essence, that's kind of what I inferred from what he was saying. He, he was asking his players to kind of step up a little bit. Yeah. I mean, 
We've, I think we've talked about it a lot before, but it's like you can't give Nebraska Alabama's playbook and vice versa and expect everything to go perfectly. But I feel like Alabama would get it done if they got Nebraska's playbook, whereas maybe the players wouldn't necessarily execute. You know, what I mean? like I don't know if you get what I'm trying to say. No, yeah, like you know. I mean, obviously, if it's better players, yes. yeah. Yeah, it's like, but that's the thing is like, one team's gonna like get it, and like not necessarily. Okay, don't take Alabama, but it's like. One team might get it done, whereas Nebraska, sometimes the players just don't execute. I don't know. I don't know. I had yeah. it in my head, yeah. but. And I like that. And Rule has literally said publicly, he hates it when coaches say, we just didn't execute. Mm-hmm. Because you're kind of just placing the, the blame on the players. Mm-hmm. He has really been adamant about not blaming the players. But I feel like he's having a really hard time not putting anything on the players. Because, I mean, part of the problem is that the players just aren't playing well. I mean, in all honesty. If the players just aren't playing well, I mean, a coach can only do so much. Yeah. The coach isn't out there, you know, playing. I mean, especially, I mean, even go to the defensive end. If if Tony White and them, you drop, you're supposed to be in the B-gap, the be in the B-gap. Like, Rule said that. He's like, if you're supposed to be in the B-gap, be in the B-gap. Like, I mean, it's just like, we make it kind of seem like rocket science, but sometimes it's just literally as simple as just be in your spot. And sometimes the players just aren't there. And, and I mean that's just, and that's on the players. That that's not a coaching thing. I, I'm not wanting to blame this all on players because it, it's everything. It, I mean, the reason Nebraska has lost what four four straight, yeah, yeah. four straight, is it, it's been a whole systematic failure. It, it hasn't been just the coaches, hasn't been just the players, hasn't been just play whatever. It's been a whole systematic failure. Coaches, players, top down, everybody. They. Everyone is the fault for why this team is on a losing streak, and it's up to all of them to fix it. Not just Rule to go out there and have to make a new different coaching hire. Okay, now we're magically going to get three more wins. If the players keep playing the same, they're not. It's not going to change. It's not going to change. It's not going to change. Now UCLA, the the loss to UCLA is looking less and less as bad. They just beat Iowa, but that UCLA team is still not this. World beater where where you should have been trailing twenty seven to seven in the third quarter at your own at home like that just that that's unacceptable. Is that some of that coaching or is that maybe Rayola throwing a pick six and not seeing the guy or the secondary having a blown coverage or whatever it is? I mean, just it, it's all of it. It's not just the coaches. I feel like a lot of the blame's been put on coaches and some of not it so needs much to, on the some of it mm-hmm. needs to be put on players. But it honestly is probably a fifty fifty. Yeah. Speaking of players, there's a couple player things we need to get to, Ray and Hall. it regarding the quarterback. First of all, for US, USC, they are changing their signal caller. Mm-hmm. Miller Moss is not going to be starting on Saturday for the Trojans. Yep. Who's starting, Danny? That's a big one. Um, one of their sophomores. Danny doesn't have the name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I ha- I had his name in the back of my head. It is Jaden Mayavi. Maya Ava? Yeah, I didn't know how to say it. J- Jaden Maya Ava. It's M A I A V A. That it's, so, it's a bit of it's a bit of a jumble. I'd have to read the pronunciation guide yeah. on it. So so what I know from Jaden is that let's call him Jaden. Yeah, to, what did what did you say, Jaden? <laughs> what I know from their backup quarterback is that he he can run it a little bit more. Okay, he's he. I mean, I don't I don't know if he's a better passer. What I, I haven't watched him enough to know that but one thing I do know is he can actually run the ball from the quarterback position and that is one thing that kind of scares me about this game is that every time Nebraska's gone against a running quarterback the run defense has kind of been a little subpar I mean go back to Illinois in the Illinois game Allmeyer was running it a little bit and it was hurting Nebraska go to Indiana Rourke was having some scrambles hurting Nebraska a little bit You want to know why the run defense was good against Ohio State? Because Will Howard can't run it at all. I mean, honestly, there were so many times if Will Howard would have just kept it and ran upfield, he could have got like 15, 20 yards. But he just can't run it, so he never really kept it. Even He kept it like, what, two times? The one time he tripped. Like, after five yards up the field, he tripped. I mean, mean, Will Howard, he's just not that good of a runner. He's just not. And then, but then you won't go back to the UCLA game. Garber's... He had a 50 – how long was that run? 50, 57 yards. 57 yard run. I mean, the quarterback run has hurt Nebraska. So that's one thing that – I feel like USC knows that, and that might be part of the reason. It's probably – it's not all just because, oh, Nebraska's the 
the next team. I mean, this was the, – they obviously think the back of quarterback is going to run the offense better, but I think specifically against Nebraska, this could really hurt Nebraska because they have not been good against a quarterback that can run it. And then on the other side of that, the quarterback situation for Nebraska on Saturday is a little cloudy. Mm-hmm. It is a little cloudy. We The status on Dylan Rayola is a little murky – um, he is, we'll see if he can practice. He's going to try and practice mm-hmm. on Tuesday. Heinrich Harburg, see it. He's getting prepped to be the starting quarterback on Saturday. But so here, here's my question to the both of you: Uh-oh. Would you rather have no, a? Don't do no. That. <laughs> no, we are we are doing this in this situation. Would you rather have a fully healthy Heinrich Harburg or a seventy five percent Dylan Rayola? Danny, why do you do this to us? <laughs> wait, okay. Mike, wait, can I ask a question? Yes, before? you can. A question um, to the question? Yeah. Do you think that it'll be all all Riola or all Harburg? Or do you think yes. it'll be back and forth? No. It'll be one it'll, or the other. It'll be one or the other. Unless one gets hurt and then obviously yeah. the other one will go. But, okay, so Danny, to answer your question, honestly, against USC specifically, I honestly do think that I'd probably be better for Harburg to be quarterback. I got to be honest. USC is not a team that can stop the run that well. And I really believe if Nebraska would just hammer it at USC, just run it down their throats, Harburg running it, get some option going, get Dowdell going, I really think that Nebraska can make this a very close game, a game that Nebraska probably wins. But now your offensive coordinator is Holgerson, a guy that likes to throw the ball more, especially downfield. And if Rayola can go, he's going to go. I mean, I just I have no doubt in my mind that Rayo, if Rayo can go, he's he's going to be the one that's going to go. Especially now that Holgerson is the guy. He wants a quarterback that he thinks can be poor for throwing the ball, and that's Rayo. Harburg looks fine throwing the ball. He's improved from from last year, mm-hmm. but still, I mean, he's not Rayo throwing the ball though. I mean, he's some of the throws Rayo makes is truly incredible. Now we can say Rayo struggled a little bit reading some defenses, blah blah blah, whatever. You can't deny just the physical attributes that Rayo has. So. To answer your question, I do think for this game specifically, Harburg would probably be better just because of the team you're playing, and they're a little bit susceptible, susceptible to the run, but I'm going to guess it's going to be Rayola. And they can still get the run game going even without Harburg. I mean, you don't need Harburg to get the run game going, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, no, I kind of agree. I think Nebraska needs one more win, and I don't. I honestly don't know where you get it the rest of these games. And I think the earlier the better. I don't want it to come down to against Iowa and you're still at five wins. But I think not only everything that Ben said, but also I think that Harburg brings just experience. Like Dylan is a freshman, and so I I agree. I think I would prefer Harburg at this point, but I think if Dylan is fine and ready to go, he'll But to be honest, I mean— you just can't really see this team benching Rayola. If, if, if he can go. If he's healthy. If he can go, but, he's going. Yeah. I mean, but you don't want Rayola to be hurt, obviously. But, I mean, if there was some kind of trepidation of not – I don't even know if I said that word right. But if there's some a little bit of um, anxiety. Trepidation. Trepidation, there you go. I, I knew I said it wrong. <laughs> if there's some kind of, you know, worry about, you know, want, not wanting Rayola's, like, feelings to get hurt or whatever, wanting to risk lose him because you bench him, this injury can maybe be kind of a blessing in disguise to be like, okay, you're not 100%. Let's sit you a game to let you get fully healthy and see what Harbor could do. I mean, th- this injury could kind of be a way for the coaches to get to see Harbor in a full game. I mean, it, it really could be like that. And to justify Rayola not playing. Exactly. I mean, and, and That's the big thing. Would Rayola be happy if he could play and then they don't play him? Probably, he probably wouldn't be happy. But, I mean, you, you could you could twist it in a way and being, let's just let you get fully healthy. I mean, you're just a freshman. like, it, it, like And, and Rayola even said after the, U, that after the UCLA game, he took himself out because he didn't feel like he was the best quarterback mm-hmm. to lead that team. At that moment— he did not feel that he was the best option to, to, to lead that offense to win that game. And that is very, like, self-evident. Um, 
aware. Yeah, self aware. Self aware, Rayola. And if he also, if he, if he thinks that again for this upcoming game, I mean, I don't think he'd be like, you know, crying in the corner or whatever. I mean, Rayola, yeah. he, he's a very her- high character guy. So if he doesn't think that he can lead the offense better than Harburg, he'd probably say let Harburg play. I mean, honestly. Which is why I think that's a that's a good counter argument to the worries about Rayola leaving mm-hmm. if he gets benched because he is such a team guy. And we don't see, and, and, I, and I strongly believe that he's also like that behind closed doors, what we don't see. I really believe that's how he is when our eyes are not on him, that he is a team guy like he showed us in that post-game press conference after UCLA, that he felt, like just Ben just described, he wasn't the best person to be out there. That's pretty high standards to be setting yourself at 19 years old, which is pretty impressive. Ben wants to say something. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> okay, it looked like you wanted to say something. I'm well, good. I but was, sorry. <laughs> you're fine. <laughs> I was you're just... fine. Um, so I think that if he has that same self-awareness to realize that he's not at his peak, he's not at his best, that maybe it's not the worst idea to give the rock to somebody else and let your body recuperate because – some players are so focused on the now, the now, the now, and they're not focused on their future. Mm-hmm. Rayola has still got three years ahead of him. He's not he's not a senior playing in his last season of eligibility, and this is all or nothing. Yeah. And it's not like he's a guy that is a starter but isn't going to play professionally. And you want to play your last couple games so you can get that experience. Then you move on, you go do something else. He still has more time after this year. Mm-hmm. If he's not fully healthy for one game out of it out of the entire season then so be it yeah i i really believe that if nebraska didn't have a backup quarterback they were confident in that rail would for sure be the starting quarterback like i i truly believe if he has to go out there this saturday he could probably do it now we don't have really any i mean we probably won't get an update on rail until rule talks to media on thursday but I mean, just, I mean that this is literally just me shot in the dark. I'm going to guess that Rayola is probably good enough to play. But is he your best option? That That's something that Rayola is going to have to ask himself. And this injury could be a way, like I said, to kind of contort it, to be like, okay, we, you're not 100%. Let's just have you sit a game. Have you sit one game, let you get fully 100% healthy, and Harbor can lead it. And I honestly think Harbor could probably – he honestly is probably the, the, the quarterback to play against USC. I mean, I truly believe that. What do you think, Danny? You didn't even answer your own question. <laughs> I'm kind of with you, although I think that while it probably will be Rayola playing, what I really want to see if it is Rayola playing, and I do agree that I do think that it, it should be Harburg this week, no matter really what it is, just skill-wise, that's just how it matches up. But if Rayola plays, I want to see Harburg out there a good mm-hmm. amount because we give him a lot of credit for his running ability, but I don't think enough people do. He can run the ball pretty well. Um, I think that Holgerson is going to take a look at Heinrich Harburg and he's be like, okay, this guy's got we, – we can design a package of plays for him and see what he can do. I mean, we have we've saw enough of Heinrich Harburg running the ball last year to know that he's very serviceable being able to move the ball on his own with his feet. Mm-hmm. So I and especially when your running back room is as stagnant as it is, maybe Harburg isn't the sexy choice to go and be the running back. Family show, family show. Oh yeah, there, that's 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 a thing. <gasps> oh my um, gosh. Maybe he's not the the best player to you know the the traditional pick to go um, be the guy to get a bunch of touches, but he's shown that he can do it. I don't think it's a bad idea to at least entertain the idea. I think the chances of Harburg coming in in packages got even smaller with Horkerson coming in. I, I just, I just got to be honest. I think, okay. I think the probability of that happening is even lower now. I, I just don't, I don't see a world where Ruin. I, I, they're just wanting to bring Harburg in for you know, like what, 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 what would you want, like ten plays? Like, I mean, I mean, it's really, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, we thought about at the beginning of the year, should should Harburg come in to start the run game up? But the run game has been better the past few weeks. 
than it was at the beginning of the season. It's slowly improving. So, and part of that is the, the passing game is just not great. And, I mean, if you bring in Harburg, the passing game is probably not going to get any better. And I think that's the thing that they need to improve. I mean, they say they want to improve the run game, improve the run game. I think they just need to lean on the run game the, more. I mean, I honestly think they just need to lean on it more. But get the pass game. Like, the passing game is what needs to get better. The running game just is what it is. There's not really much you can do to improve your running game. Just like, you know, okay, we're going to only just, like, we're just going to do all these different kind of run plays. Like, you just run it, you know, inside zone, either outside, inside, pitch, whatever. I mean, there's just not much you can do to change up the way you're running the ball. It's what are other factors that can make it easier to run the ball. And that's, if you can get this passing game going, it'll help their run game. And that's kind of, I feel like, I, I think that's kind of the hope um, with Horgerson coming in to try to get the passing game going. So before we go to pro- projecting a little bit more of the game, we're going to switch gears so, because there's a sport that's back. Nebraska ball has returned. Nebraska. So both teams have played two games, men's team and women's team. They're both, both 2-0. and They're both 2-0. and The women's Woo! team is ranked now number 21. They were, they were ranked 23, Dan. They were ranked 23, but now they're 21. Yes. So they, so they went up two spots. And just looking at the, the the rankings, you're just thinking, I mean, everything is great with Nebraska ball, right, Danny? <laughs> you just think everything's great. Let, let's start on the men's side. Um, you just want to start? Okay. Yeah, let, let's just go right into it. Um, I'm not ready to ring the alarm bells yet. You're not? No, I'm not. The, the red flag is not all the way at the top of the pool yet after two games? <laughs> no, uh, it is It is a maybe 20% up. Um, it is still way too early to get concerned, but I think there is um, some reason to have a little bit of suspicion um, this is a game that they probably should have won when they played uh, Bethune Cookman on Saturday. A game they probably should have won by more than five points. Um, that that shouldn't be news to anyone. Breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking news. Um, but <laughs> this is a team, though, and I'm going to steal. Uh, I was talking to Jacob Bigelow earlier today. I'm going to oh. steal. I'm going to steal his quote from what he texted me when I was asking. Way to him. cite your sources, Danny. Oh, thank you. He he basically said that it's this team right now is a team of strangers who are picked by a bunch of captains to go play some pickup ball on the playground. Now, Danny, let me let me just let me just respond. Okay. First of all, you said. It's too early to be concerned. I don't. I I really don't think it's too early to be concerned about Nebraska's chances just as a whole in the Big Ten. I I don't think it's too early. This team is going to get better. Obviously, this is a team with a bunch of new players that came in. They need to develop chemistry. The team's going to be better by the time February rolls around than they are right now. Obviously, you can say that with probably almost any team. But. I think there's valid concern that last year you relied heavily on three-point shooting, and this year you just don't have three-point shooters. No, four for 22 from I the mean, yard. And, and I mean, and my concern over the offseason was you lost Tomonaga, you lost uh, C.J. Wilcher, and who's the other shooter they lost? Uh, they lost to Marcus Lawrence. And you, uh, and you lost Lawrence. And Rink Bass is hurt. I mean, so so that's why. I said. So Lawrence, Tominaga, CJ Wilcher, those are probably your three best three point shooters last year. Yeah. I mean, I want to say I yeah. think those are your three best three point shooters. Yeah. You lost all of them, and you really didn't re- replace them. You got Connor season and I mean, his forte is three point shooting, but he didn't shoot the ball that great last year at Wisconsin. I mean, and this is kind of the thing, and this is a football and basketball conversation. You're like, oh, we got somebody from Wisconsin. Wisconsin's always been good, you know, basketball. Oh, we got this player from Texas or this player from blah, 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 this ex big school. You want to know why they're leaving those big schools? It's probably because maybe they got casted off. And I think if these bigger teams wanted to keep these players, like really wanted to keep them, they would have kept them. I mean, I'm just stating the obvious that I, I think there's a reason that they're leaving these big schools. The way you build teams right now is not going to picking up the, the lef- leftover scraps of these big, big time schools. It's going in the, to these smaller schools and picking up their good players. What did Indiana do? They didn't go get some guy that got fired from a big power five school. They went and got Kurt Signetti, who was coaching James Madison. We're talking about football, by the way. 
I, now we're talking about football. I get it, but still, <laughs> same idea. It's same idea. No, for yeah, both. no, it's same I'm, idea for both though. Very much and, and so. He brought in a bunch of James Madison players, good James Madison players, like players that are actually good, not these castoffs that I mean are not. It's not that they're terrible, but I mean, a, James Madison's best players are probably better players than the guys that got quote unquote rejected from these big time schools. I mean, honestly, they pro- they're probably yeah. better. I mean, I, I feel like teams get so caught up in, in name brand, but I got that is a little bit off of a tangent, but still. Season, but it's relevant. No, season, I think season, it's very he, relevant. I mean, he, he, he's an okay three-point shooter. He, he can be a huge part of this team if he can get the three-point shooting going, but he showed last year that he struggled a little bit from behind the arc, and that's kind of his forte. So you have questions there, but they just don't have shooting, and that and that's that's the problem. They went 19 for 55 from they, the field. They didn't improve. Saturday. I want to let you guys talk, but they didn't improve enough on the defensive end to overcome everything they lost on the offensive end. You didn't replace Kese Tominaga. You didn't replace the bench production of C.J. Wilcher. And you didn't replace the ball handling that Jamarcus Lawrence was bringing you. I mean, you just, you just didn't, you really didn't. I mean, you got some ball handlers. I, I, I guess that is kind of one thing they got. But I'm saying the shooting. You just, you just don't, you don't have a go-to scorer. Bryce Williams is kind it's kind of that, but he's not a perimeter scorer. You don't have a go-to perimeter scorer, and you don't have guys that can catch and shoot. That That's trouble for, I mean, disaster. I mean, this team could easily be middle of the pack or like a top edge of the top five. I mean, right now, I would say their ceiling is like fifth or sixth in the Big Ten. I think that's Nebraska's ceiling right now. Like, I would... If this if this team becomes a bubble team by the end of the year, I think you got to be giving Hoiberg a lot of credit because I, I just... This three-point shooting is going to have to get better. You, you just can't win games if you can't shoot. Yeah, I mean, I think Nebraska basketball has never historically been that great. and so Really? I've never <laughs> heard of that. Hmm. Who would have it? I used to get made fun of in I went to school in Iowa because they wouldn't even make the NIT, you know? And so I think the past year or so, they've actually been making really good improvements, and they've been performing pretty well. So I think expectations are really high now, especially after last season. And just looking at the stats and looking at the score and it doesn't make me too confident. No, and I'm going to push back a little bit on being super concerned right now. I, I, I where, Okay, where, where are you at on the concernometer? I'm on the concernometer that people thought this was a team that could come back and make it to the NCAA tournament. And as it currently stands and just, you know, projecting for – how much can this team improve by the end of the year? I just don't see this team getting to the NCAA tournament. Okay. That, that's I, my level of concern. This can still be a fine season no, in the yeah. middle of the pack team. I'm but. I'm not at that point after a week of the season. I If we're at this same – I think that this week coming up is going to tell us a lot. It will. They have a, they have a couple gauntlet games coming up when they have to play St. Mary's and Creighton. In two games in about six days. I can't even believe you uttered the word St. Mary's. I had them making the Final Four last year, and they <laughs> didn't do anything. <laughs> they got bounced first round. But How they, dare you? St. St. Mary's, though, in the last couple of seasons, has been one of the better mid-major teams. Not and, in the NCAA tournament. But not in the NCAA tournament. But during the regular season, they You have, struck a chord with me, Danny. Continue, though. Anyway. <laughs> and, then, and then you've got Creighton, who's... They started really hot. I mean, had your number. They've had Ryan Kolkbrenner had what thirty points or something like that in their opening game. That should scare Husker fans. And, and un, <laughs> an ungodly like number that he put that he put up in their first game. What does Nebraska do better than Creighton this year in basketball? Yes. Well, they won't be better than them in <laughs> men's basketball. That's but, for sure. But this is what, about this is what I'm saying. Like, I just I really don't see any chance in Nebraska winning that game. I, I mean, I get it's a basketball game. It's not like football where I mean the uh, the team that's worse can go out there and win. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's why West Town to go out there and win easily. But I, I just they they don't have any. They don't have the post play advantage. They don't shoot it better than them. Well, we'll get into that a little bit more next week. If we will. But but I, we will. We will. I'm not ready to say like all is lost. They're they're not making the tournament. I, I haven't like, said that. I was gonna no. say I don't think either of us are at that point. I th- I think there there is some cause for concern, but I'm not ready to say that like this is going to be a struggle this year just because it's they've only played I think four games games that yes. includes games that's counted mm-hmm. and games that haven't counted. So they're still trying to figure themselves out. I mean, we got to remember that 
this is a and I love that Bigelow said this that this is just a team of assembled strangers for the most part. Fred Hoiberg loves the transfer portal. And that's the, that was where I was wanting to go just to wrap up this entire conversation is the transfer portal. When you rely on the transfer portal as much as Hoiberg has, you, you're going to get some really good years and you're going to get some pretty bad years. I mean, that, that's just and that, that's not just basketball. I mean, that's also football. I mean, go and look at Colorado. Colorado was not good last year. They look pretty dang good this year. I mean, you just when you rely on that, you just have such an up and down team. And then when things get bad early, it can easily you can easily lose the team more than if you know build it from the ground up and you have guys that have been there for three, four years. It's not as likely that the team's just gonna fall apart after a losing spree. Like Nebraska, you wanna know why that not all hope is lost from the Nebraska football team? Because they have a lot of guys that have been there for four or five years that have been through the thick and thin of all of that's happened with Husker football and you think hope that they could pull out one more win to get a sixth win but with this basketball team you have what three returning players not, that not, actually not, that not, actually contributed yeah not counting mast this year but it's really Bryce Jawan and Hoiberg yes pretty much and Hoiberg's not even really a big big part of the team so you really not just a have, huge part yeah you really just have Bryce Williams and Jawan Gary they've been playing meaningful minutes that are coming back from last yeah, year meaningful well. minutes yes so I mean you, you just, I mean, this. I said this, it wouldn't surprise me if this is a top five team. After watching the first two games, I'd be a little bit surprised. But also, wouldn't surprise me if this is a bottom three team in the Big Ten. I mean, it just it just really wouldn't surprise me. I mean, when you just rely on the transfer portal so much, it, it's so hard to predict how the team's going to lay out because you just don't know how they're going to play together. I think that the next two weeks are going to tell us a lot. Yes. Um. And then we'll get a better grasp on, I think, where this team is heading into Thanksgiving. We'll have a better idea going into December. I think that while the first two games were a little troublesome, I think that there's a lot to learn from them for sure. But the competition has not stepped up just yet. And I think when they play... St. Mary's and what's essentially going to be a home game in Sioux Falls. Um, and then they have to go to Creighton. Um, that's going to show us a lot about where, the, about how far this team has come and just where they're at. I, Danny, I think we'll, I'll let you we'll know, know more. I'll let you know where they're at when March rolls by. And we're in April. <laughs> I'll let you know. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll analyze the team and, and let you know. Where this team should be standing at in April? How about we analyze some some something on the women's team? No, let's do that. Let's do that. I, I was at the game. On ben Saturday. Ben actually was at the game. I was at the game. I was also I, at the I, game. I had some tech. So you were you were announcing it. I was you? yes. Yes, you were. You made me question. I was like, I was like, I swear that I've was ac- Danny. I've actually got. I've actually gotten to do their first three like open games this nice. year, which has been pretty pretty cool. Um, I actually got to call Brit Prince's. Um, last game in high school and her first game in college, which was pretty fun. That's um, pretty cool, it, Danny. it was pretty cool. Um, so they had a 78-68 win over southeastern Louisiana on Saturday. That was you, – you You hear the numbers and you think, oh, they, they painted it to them. No, that wasn't the case at all. Um, southeastern Louisiana led for more than half the game. 25 minutes. Nebraska, Nebraska only led for 10 minutes. Uh, they finally pulled away late in the game. Great fourth quarter. It, it was a very exciting fourth quarter, that's for sure. The, I didn't think the place could get that loud. I PBA didn't either. Was, it wasn't that full. And we and there was, was no 4,000 screaming kids in the stands <laughs> either. But the one thing that Ben and I both agreed on after the game was over is that Natalie Potts is really, really dangerous. She is going to be the key to how far this team can go because so much attention is going to be on Markowski and who didn't play very well on Saturday either I I don't I'm not even like I'm not even here to like say that though because they they just I mean they didn't look too good every time she touched the ball I mean there was just two people on her I mean it's just she's game playing well I mean she's doing I mean Markowski I mean if you are drawing a double team you're kind of doing your job (laughs) I mean there's not. Yeah. I mean, you, you can't be expected to go out there and give twenty and ten when you're getting pressured that much. It's on other people to produce, and that's what they were doing. 
Natalie Potts was shooting the ball well. That's key. If Natalie Potts can start shooting the ball really consistent, she's shot it okay at times last year, but like I'm talking like if she can shoot 35 plus percent from deep this year. She shot four for five from three. Yeah, so like having that next to Markowski is going to be dangerous for this team. But let's go over to the defensive side of the ball real quick because that's that's the area of concern. You know mm-hmm. this team can make threes. You know Markowski's going to get hers in the paint. Nowy Potts is really good on offense. But the defensive side, specifically the interior defense, did not look great on no. Saturday. They gave up 40 points in the paint. 34 of those were through the first three quarters. Why didn't Nebraska pull away in the fourth? Because they only gave up six points in the paint. Yeah, it was... Uh... It was not a good look. Markowski didn't. She looked a on little defense, outmatched. Yeah, on, on, defense. on defense, she looked a little outmatched. Mm-hmm. She did. And they were just finding their. They were just finding their way to to get around. Lexi Alexander had a really good game. I, Alexius Horn, was really impressive. She yeah. How play, many How many points did their top score have? She finished with twenty four. Yeah. Um, she did not play at all last year. She was out with an injury. Um. But she had a really good 22-23 season. She's This is technically going to be her sixth season in college. She missed two seasons uh, with injury, and she had a really good day. Lexi Alexander was a huge problem. Um, I think Nebraska did not game plan very well for her, especially when it came to second-chance opportunities. It seemed like whenever that there was a bucket missed, that it was Lexi Alexander that was there to pick it up. And put the ball back up. Not so much um, Cheyenne Daniels, who's one of the, one of their other um, post players. But I was very concerned by the defense. And so Markowski is not a big that can just dominate the paint defensively. You know what I mean? Like there, there's some bigs. I mean, I'm I'm more I guess talking. You know, especially men's basketball. I mean, you have some bigs in men's basketball that can just eat the paint. Like you, like you want them to come into the paint because you want them to have to try to shoot over the, the seven foot guy that he's probably going to go and block it. Women's basketball, it's a lot different because you don't have um, post players that can usually defend on that kind of level, and that's that's kind of the case with Murkowski. She's she's an offensive player more than mm-hmm. defensive, so you have to rely a lot more on rotation, team defense, not just you know funneling it into the big. And, and and Amy Williams said it post game. They just they weren't rotating that well, and I think that's something that it, it, it kind. Of, I mean, you you you're concerned about it right now, but that's something that can get fixed. Yeah. I mean, e- I mean, easily. That's something like, oh, this team can't rotate on defense good enough. That's something that can be fixed. Three point shooting. Eh. Either you're kind of a good three point shooting team, or you're not. A and good they were not a good three point shooting team in the exhibition against Doan in the opening game against Omaha. They, Those numbers were way down. They were lighting it. And up then they, they had 14 on Saturday. They were 14 for 29. Yeah, that's, that's 48 percent from three. That's why they won. I mean, if they weren't hitting at that clip, if they were only shooting like 30, I mean, even 38 percent, which is still pretty decent. If they're only shooting 38%, though, they probably lose that game. But back to the defense, though. Yes. The, the rotation, yeah, I, I'm i with you. That was It was not very, very good. But there was a there was also a lot of defensive breakdowns as well. They were, the, the Lions were finding open lanes. Usually, It was usually on the left side, too, where they were able to put left-hand hooks up and just get very easy layups. Yeah. I mean, there, there is so – in basketball, you want to eliminate – the easy shots as much as possible. You got you want to make everything. You want you want to make them work for everything. If they have to take the entire shot clock and take a tough shot and they make it, you kind of just throw your hands up and go on to the next play. I mean that that happens in basketball, but you want to make it just as tough as possible because the harder you make it, the more those percentage, more the their shooting percentage is going to go down. They just had I mean southern, I mean they just had so many easy shots. Southeastern Louisiana, they just had so many easy shots right at the rim. I mean they had forty points in the paint. I mean, that's just something that they know. Nebraska knows that needs to be cleaned up. And um, I'm trying to think of who it was post game. I think it was Cowan Hake who said, Southeastern Louisiana, they they punched us first, but you can bet on Tuesday we're going to be punching first in that game. So I, I think fans should be pretty excited to watch the game on Tuesday because I think that game kind of would have fire under them a little bit because they know they didn't play up to their standards. Yeah, I feel like that's the most exciting thing to watch with teams is when they. Or like not even lose a game, but when it's just like a close game, kind of how it was um, against Southeast Louisiana. Um, 
they I always like to see the games after because you know they're like mad or frustrated about it so I always like to see how they come out you can say it's like you know SMU and volleyball that like lit a fire yeah, under them. I was about to say the volleyball team mm-hmm. if Nebraska wins that game are they on the tear that they're on right now I mean maybe but they're I pro- there's probably another there's, there's probably a, a loss somewhere. baked in there somewhere yeah. I mean this is what I mean some I mean you you never want to lose, obviously, but sometimes you need that loss to kind of light the fire under you to get mm-hmm. to yeah. get the rest of the season going. And that's what happened with the volleyball team, and they didn't lose this game, but they know that they didn't play up to their standards, and, and they're not gonna. No, you're good. They're not gonna allow that. And that's why I like these games to happen early because mm-hmm. I like when teams are able to see that okay, we have some work to do. We need to make those improvements, and they're able to make those and learn quick. As opposed to, like, we talked about in volleyball, other teams that are losing later in the season and it's their first loss, and then they kind of have to reshift later in the season when games start to get more important and they're stuff for competition. A couple of quick takeaways also from this. that I had takeaways. Uh, you did have takeaways, but a couple <laughs> things that that I have noticed over the first three games, which is counting the exhibition. Not a game. What, but still a game where things happened. Doesn't count towards the record, doesn't count towards the stats, but things still happen. Okay, Danny. Um, Logan Nisley is going to be primarily a three-point shooter. Mm-hmm. I mean, she went four for ten, and she took one extra shot outside of that. That's what seems like is going to be her role this year. I don't have a problem with that because her three-point shooting has was really good last year, and if that's the role she's going to be put into, then so be it. Petra Bojan might be the most surprising player so yeah, far. She hit both um, threes. But before I expand on that, it has, and we saw this similarly with volleyball when Olivia Maux broke out, Laney Choboy's playing time went down. Same thing is happening with Jess Petrie. I think that there was a lot of room for Petrie this year to continue to grow. I thought that she was going to be the heir apparent to where Markowski was and that by her junior year, she'd be playing a lot of valuable minutes. She only played five minutes on, uh, on, on Saturday, which the way that she's been used, when you look at that just in that perspective is a little surprising, but then when you consider how well Bojan's been playing, it doesn't even you you can't even put the two together. Bojan has not missed a shot from the field all season. No, she and and she's missed one shot from the free throw line. That's it. A big part of this team has always been survive when Markowski is on the bench. Survive the non Markowski minutes. I feel like that. Am I wrong to think that? Mm-mm. Like, like it's Mm-mm. always been survive when Markowski is not on the field. You don't need to like. You're not even looking to go plus. You're just looking to go even. Like you're just just survive it. And that's with every team's best player, obviously, but especially a post player, survive without Markowski. I feel like this team is very well equipped equipped to when Markowski's on the bench. They have some players that can actually give some pretty good production. Yeah, absolutely. And the f- not having Britt Prince playing on Saturday, um, I think we got to see more of what Birdie Rendall can bring. Yep. Um, I think she's going to maybe force her hand into the starting lineup once Prince gets back. I think that Prince's spot in the lineup is pretty safe until she loses it. Yes. Um, Allison Widener's play was a little concerning. Um, You want to talk? So we we can get into that, but I think that when like the second team offense is out there, I think Rendell's going to be your main scorer. Nisley, I, I, she's probably going to be playing or shooting a lot from beyond the arc. I would like to see her get inside a little bit more. Maya Hargrove has also been a nice surprise to see as as well. She she was getting burned up pretty bad on the interior on defense, but on the offensive side, I didn't think she played too terribly to to start out. Mm-hmm. But Widener's the main my main takeaway on just when you're talking about individual players, especially on offense. It's like okay, I want to cut her a little bit of slack because she hasn't played. Literally like three years. in in basically a year and a half. Yeah, but there comes a time and a place to like, okay, we can't cut you the slack anymore. I mean, I'm. I mean, we're in the second second game of the season. Danny wants to say third game of the season, <laughs> but we're in the second. All right, game. we're in the second game of the season. Um, I mean, wine is going to get better. She just. I mean, you have to shake off the rust. But my bigger question is, 
is there someone on this roster that can replace Josh Shelley's value that she brought? Not all of it, but I'm saying replace enough of it to where it's not going to hurt Nebraska this season that they don't have a guard that can really score in the perimeter. Is there is that player on the roster? That's what I don't know. And I think when you're talking about production, point scoring, that's where I think Britt Prince fits in. I, I think that's the closest maybe they I have. think that's the closest they have. Yeah. But when you're talking about general point production, Natalie Potts has taken a huge jump. And that's been very evident in the first week that Natalie Potts is going to be one of their go-to scorers. I mean, she was last year too. There's a reason she won eight freshman of the week awards. Mm-hmm. I mean, the she, next she, the next closest good. had three. Yeah. She should have been player player of the year for for the freshman across coaches and media. I still don't really understand how she didn't get it from the media, but she still got it nonetheless from the coaches, which I think matters just matters a little bit more. But that's another thing. Um, we don't I, have time for that. Dan. We don't. We don't have time for that. Um, I think that. She's going to be more of an option. I have really like what I've seen from Berde Rindall to start. Her shot is very, very pure, and her mechanics are are really great. I think we're going to see more minutes from Bojan. I've been yeah. very impressed with her. When you consider the fact that she didn't even sign with the team until the day before the fall semester started this year, and she really wasn't in the cards over the summer – you you add that into there, and I mean, all training camp, she was kind of viewed as a wild card, and she's come out, and she's I mean, yeah, it's it's not Big Ten opponents, it's Omaha who hasn't really played all that well, and th- but then southeastern Louisiana, I remember talking after the game to who I was calling the game with on the radio, and we were like. This team will probably win the Southland Conference. That, 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 that team wasn't bad. No, that's what, that's they're not like, bad. Th- th- this, that game was not like a, oh, man, that, the, you only won by 10. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's not at all what that game was like. But it was kind of a wake-up call yeah. to be like, okay, we have some Nebraska has some stuff that they need to improve on. But my whole thing is, no, you're not concerned about Nebraska's offense against some of these lower-level teams. Their even, offense even is going to the, be fine. Even middle of the pack. I'm talking about... This team's aspirations is NCAA tournament. How many wins can you get in the NCAA tournament? And all those games are going to be close. And when you need a game bucket at the end of the game, who was the go-to person last year? It was Josh it, Shelley. It, it was Josh Shelley. Is their go-to person going to be Natalie Potts? I, I don't, I don't see that. I think we're going to to find that out as the season goes along. I mean, it's really hard to rely on a forward to be that go-to person in critical moments because you need someone that can create something on the perimeter. We are only we are only two games into the season. I get, and, yeah, and, and, and I'm overreacting. We only it. saw Britt Prince for one game. Exactly. And so, she didn't she didn't have her best game in the opener against Omaha. I think after we have probably about six weeks on the tape as we're getting into conference play. Yeah. I think we're going to see a lot from from Britt Prince, yes. and it's a it's a shame that she didn't get to play in this game. Had like an ankle. She was thing. she was nursing the the right ankle. She had a brace on. She was in. She was participating in shoot around before the game, and she looked pretty okay. You, she was a little ginger on it, but you don't want to. I mean, you don't. We're not going to. We're not going to speculate. Yeah. Um, but I think she would have made a bigger impact on this game than we probably give her credit for, just because she didn't play. But I think for everyone around her, I mean, Rimdahl and Nisley both finished with 14 points apiece. I think that for the second team offense, at least, whatever shape or form that that goes in, is going to be pretty good. Yeah. And not a lot of teams can say that. Amy Williams, and this is probably going to be pretty crazy to say, but not necessarily when we look at it in this scope, she kind of has an embarrassment of riches. Everybody on this team can play. Everybody gets everyone who's healthy will play. Everybody does. That's just how she's worked her team, and it does work. Yeah, it worked last year. Everybody can contribute. Um, but yeah, I mean that. I mean, everyone is playing their roles, and that and that's the thing. I mean, the the main thing though is can someone be that alpha just on offense? That's what I think Britt that, Prince is going to and, be. And, and if that's Britt Prince, then, I mean, I think you got a really good team. I mean, that's, that's literally my only concern is does this team have a go-to score? Because, I mean, you know Markowski is going to play good. Potts is really improved. This is a good three-point shooting team. All of that. But 
Um, the defense is a little concerning, but I think that'll get better. But yeah. it, it's that go-to. That'll work itself out. I think we're going to learn a lot, though, in the next in the next three weeks, especially right. when it comes to Prince's development. You want to go to U at Nebraska USC? Let's do that for a couple of minutes. Um, very. Are we very... giving score predictions? Sure, we can do score predictions. Uh oh, I didn't come prepared. <laughs> I didn't either. <laughs> but you know what? I'll throw one out there. So All right. Are we just doing that right now? We, we can do that. Sure. Okay. So, um, Nebraska coming off a bye. Point. <laughs> USC, who also came off a bye. Um, USC's record, what are they? Four, four, and no, they four, four and five? Four and four? Four and five, I want to say. I don't know. I'm stupid. I think they're four and five. Don't say that. That's. Not I nice. think they're four and five off the top of my noggin. Um, <laughs> Let me check on that for you. USC has not been great this year. Like, they looked really good. Four and five, you're right. They looked really good at the beginning of the year, beat LSU. Everyone was like, oh, man, is this going to, I mean, this is a ranked team. Then they barely, um, they they barely lost to Michigan, right? Yes, that was yeah. A they close barely game. lost to Michigan, and then the season kind of just is falling apart a little bit for them. Um, but I mean, this isn't a they're not a bad team, and they've also faced some adversity. They, they, they have, they have. Um, but you, the Nebraska having to go to LA to play USC, coming off of coming off of a bye week. And we saw the last time Nebraska having to travel on the road after a bye week. It didn't it didn't look too great. Now that was Indiana. Indiana's a really good team. Like really, really good team. Yeah. USC is not that. I think we're we're pretty confident that USC right now in this season is not as good as Indiana. I think I would go to the grave with that statement. So Wow. Nebraska <laughs> should this should be a competitive game. Like, there's no world where USC should come in and beat Nebraska by two scores or whatever. But I really feel like this game is going to be dependent on can Nebraska get the run game going. I mean, that that's what it is. And what can get the run game going? Is it going to be an improved passing attack? Is it going to be the offensive line playing a little bit better? Get some the running backs... Um, Dowdell continuing to get more consistent. I mean that that's the question. I don't mean to jump in on this, no, but I think good. they think this is important to to add to add the scope. Daniel. Is that if you if USC does not win this game this week, they're probably not going to a bowl game. If they lose to Nebraska, they will have UCLA next, which is basically a home game no matter if they play it at the Coliseum or the Rose Bowl, because UCLA fans just don't fill the Rose Bowl. And then they have to play Notre Dame at home. We've yep. seen how good Notre Dame has been. I, for one, am very happy about it. Danny, we don't but, need to hear that. <laughs> but, but, but what I'm saying is, is that USC is probably not going to beat Notre Dame. They're already 4-5. and five. If they don't win this game, they're probably not going to go bowling. Um, and, that, and that's even with UCLA looking better. My, my only thing with this is I, I just, you just don't know how much this USC team really even cares about that. I mean, I'm I, I'm sorry to say that, but like, and that's they, unfortunate they, to they, say they, for a Lincoln they, Riley team. They they just, I mean, they just don't look like a team that's just fired up to try to get that sixth win. And you can kind of say the same thing about the way Nebraska played against UCLA. I mean, they, they didn't look like a team that was dying to get their sixth win either. I mean, so it's kind of both teams. One team's gonna get a win. One team's either gonna get five wins and hopefully get one more in USC, or one team's gonna be bowling like one team has to get pushed over the edge <laughs> one team has to like, win the game one team has to win this game <laughs> they can't both lose one <laughs> team is going to be the team that um gets out of its own way because i feel like both of these teams have kind of gotten in their own way a little bit usc's had a harder schedule but definitely they i mean both teams have kind of gotten in their own way a little bit so it's, it's going to be a really interesting game i kind of expect it to be a little bit of an ugly game i'm not going to say it's going to be as ugly as like the rutgers game but like this isn't going to be a pretty game by any means for Nebraska, just like the UCLA game was. It wasn't wasn't pretty. I mean, not, what what Nebraska game has been pretty? Colorado, I mean, sure. they, they, they haven't had a sure. pretty game. So I, I mean, this is pretty obvious for me to say. But if I was going to give score prediction, I think this is going to be a decently high scoring game. I'm not. Which say by by games, the way, but. I think this might be the first game of the year that we disagree on. Oh, that that we all disagree that we like unilaterally will disagree agree on because. The, I think the only game where we disagreed on was when Rutgers. What was Rutgers, and you were the one to center. Everyone else picked Nebraska. You picked Rutgers. And and I think that's the only one so far where we haven't all agreed on the same thing. I think there's going to be more of a split split this week. There's going to be more of a split, and I still stand by that Rutgers <laughs> because 
that game could have went completely different. All right. I mean, come on, anybody. Okay, whatever. Yeah. If Don't Rutgers, live in the past. If Rutgers just scores at the two yard line, that Nebraska <laughs> is their toast. Yeah. But powder toast, um, man. But for this game, I think this is going to be a decently high scoring game. But I just. It's just it's so hard to predict this game because you don't know what the offense is going to look like under Holgerson, and that like this has been this is the hardest game for me to predict because I, I just I have no idea what's going to happen. It wouldn't surprise me if Nebraska went out there and won by two scores. It wouldn't surprise me if USC went out there and won decently either. So I, I'm going to though go with my gut and I'm going to say I just think USC is just the better team. I I really think they're just the better team. This is kind of similar to UCLA. Be like, oh, but the record's not that good. Well, look at who they've played. And this is a team that's based in LA. They have some talent. I mean, if you are if you are UCLA or USC, you have talent on that team. There's no way you can be an LA team, a a, a power f- five four, whatever we want to call it, power a power, power four, con- a power conference school from LA and not have talent. So they're gonna have some talent and. It, 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 I just I think it's gonna be kind of I don't want to say it's gonna be similar to the UCLA game, but this is this is gonna be a fight. It's, it's probably gonna go down all the way to the end. I, I and Nebraska has not come up on the favorably in those kind of games this season, so that's why I'm gonna go USC. I'm gonna probably go like I'm gonna go like on the spot 30-27. Okay. You, you need to think about yours. Yeah, because I'm like right. back and forth. I'll I don't all right. Know. I'll go next. Um, I'm going to go with the assumption that Dylan Rail will be playing. And he will be the quarterback. As much as we have come to the consensus that it should be probably Heinrich Harburg starting on Saturday. We're saying if we were just trying to win this game, like yeah. Yeah. Just you have to win game. this game. Like I would just this game. Mm-hmm. I still think it's going to be Rayola starting. Yeah, I, I mm-hmm. it's that's just the reality of the situation. And I'm kind of with Ben on this one. I I do think it will be USC that comes out on top of it. As much as I think that switching up who the play caller is, at this point, it's just, it is what it is. It doesn't matter who you're going to put in the room at this point. You're at the position that you are. Your receivers can't get open. Your O-line is subpar with their blocking. Yep. Your quarterback, your starting quarterback, is resistant to run the ball. You've had increment, very small incremental improvements in the running game, but that's not saying much. I mean, when you start at rock bottom and you take two steps forward, I mean, You're still at rock. Bottom. I, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sold yet. Um, none of us are sold. None, none, none of, of us, us are sold. saying no. we're sold, Danny. <laughs> I, I'm not sold. And if you're gonna sell me, then do something on Saturday. But I'm what? not buying. I'm oh, who to thunk it? Um, I'm not buying what is what's being sold, even if it's not anything good. So you don't want buyer's remorse, Danny. <laughs> you don't want buyer's remorse. You're right. I don't. Um, I think that pulling Miller Moss is going to. I think that that's what's worrying me about this game, honestly. Yeah, I think that's going to do some good for for USC. Mm-hmm. I think the fact that Lincoln Riley is going to have someone new that he gets to throw out there is going to be. Uh, a little entertaining for him, and so, he's gonna and something different than Nebraska has to prepare for. Exactly, and that's why I'm giving USC the edge in this one. I think that's one of the reasons. And this this might seem like a totally random thing to throw into this, but teams traveling from the Midwest to the West Coast have not fared well. No, and another reason, <laughs> another, and that that's another thing that we didn't even discuss, and probably is worth discussing, but. We don't got time, Danny. Uh, we, we don't got time for it, but who's to say that this Nebraska team can go out and prove everybody wrong? Be, put your hand down, Ben. Uh, because <laughs> you didn't choose them to <laughs> I I am not in that camp. I and I'm not I, saying there's no chance. I just I don't think I don't think there is. I, I really don't. I think we are too far down this rabbit hole that they're there's just no saving them this year. If they get a bowl game, great. But so, so you, so you, you, re- you really don't think Nebraska is going to win this game? Like you're I, pretty confident. I'm pretty confident that they are not going to win it. I think that they might be leading the game at one point. Maybe they get ahead by a field goal or something like that. But I don't think they win the game. See, now that's one of my things is 
in games where Nebraska's jumped out early, they have fared very well in. Mm-hmm. So the, I don't think they the, will. The the, the, the just, but you just said that you could see them getting a score early. I, I think if no, Nebraska— No, no, no. I'm saying that I think they could lead at some point. I'm not saying they're going to win uh, the game. Yes, but so, but I'm saying if Nebraska does jump out to an early lead, that's really going to bode well for Nebraska because this is a team that's built to like play with a lead. This is not a team built to play from behind. Somehow yeah. they were able to get back into the game against UCLA, and that's just because UCLA kept having unsportsmanlike penalties for whatever reason. But— this is not a team that's built to come from behind, especially when you have an offense like USC that's pretty decent. Question They're okay. Mark? Question mark. Question mark. Question mark. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, so I, th- this team they need they need to start off well, and this season Nebraska has not started off well. No. Ever since ever since the uh, I want to say Colorado, but even in the Rutgers game, they started off the Rutgers game decently, and you kind of just play with the wheat. Like th- that's that's how they want to play. And I think the problem with that philosophy, though, is when you don't start off great, the team's kind of like, well, now what? <laughs> well, to give my prediction, I Predict. think it's going to be uh, 35-24 in favor of USC. You, you, what was the score? 35-24. to 24. Oh, so you have an 11-point game. I have an 11-point game. See, yeah, I, did, I don't know if they can score that much on Nebraska. That, that's my only yeah. thing is I think my 30-point is decently high, and you went 35. So I don't know. what. Do you know what the over-under is on points? Mm, points? That's a great question. I'll look at that while Evan gives her score prediction. Um, okay, I'm also going USC. She's 100% confident in this, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the score is where I'm having trouble because I just, I never know what Nebraska's going to show up. Like, I think you. Okay, I got, I got our lines. You ready for this? Uh, Nebraska opened at plus eight and a half. Yes, it can. But what's the total? Like, over or under? Uh, 50 and a half. 50 and a half. So they think it's going to be like a. 28 20 or 27 24 kind of a game it looks like it and if you want to know what the money lines are right now usc is at a minus 340 and nebraska is at a plus 270 the spread nebraska plus nine is about a 10 about minus 107 and usc i'm trying to do the math what 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 score are they predict so usc's favored by eight and they they have what the over-under is 48 Fifty and a half. Oh, 50 and a half. So they think, oh my gosh, they're thinking it's going to be like a 28 to 28, 20, maybe. Yeah. Or 30, 22. Something like that. Yeah. Something like that. Something out, something out of, out of there. Um, but continue. Yeah. Anna. That's, that's pretty close to, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll let you continue though. Sorry. Um, we went off on a little bit of a. <laughs> no, I think USC will win, but I don't know. To me, I'm thinking, I don't, I'm not going to go as high as you guys are. Wrong. <laughs> she's she's saying, smashing the under. I'm saying 21-28. Okay. But I okay. do think USC will win. I just, I don't see Nebraska. I don't see where they win the rest of the season. I don't. I mean, but to be That's fair. a very fair I, point. So, coming after the UCLA game, I was fairly confident that Nebraska was not going to win another game. I could see them maybe winning one more. But to be fair, USC hasn't looked good this season. Wisconsin is just eh. And Iowa just lost to UCLA and they were having to play like their fifth string quarterback that was like a linebacker or whatever. So I mean that just like all these games are games that you gotta think Nebraska has a shot at winning. It's not like it's not like Ohio State's coming in here where you just you just like they're gonna be like twenty point dogs or whatever. Like all these games are gonna be the close games that Nebraska could be barely underdogs in. Like I and and that's if if Nebraska fans want hope, which I feel like that's what all Husker fans want right now, is just hope. Is that I mean the last three teams they're playing just aren't that good. But I mean I just got to be honest, they're just they're, these are all winnable games. To me, like the last I don't know the last time Nebraska beat Wisconsin. Like I get that every team they've different. lost their last like I think eight the or nine last games. ten I, the last ten games they lo- they've lost against Wisconsin. That's why I'm just like I get that they're not as good, but I just still don't buy it. And then, like, yeah, Iowa, but then I, I don't know. I just don't. See, the thing that scares me about the Iowa game is it's, it's, at, at, it's Iowa. at Iowa. Wisconsin's really had your number, and mm-hmm. you're traveling to USC. That's so, I mean, I and, and, and yes, the, I see your concern. And honestly, I am concerned. Everyone should be concerned that this team might not get to a six win. Like, they're like, we're not out of line here to be like, oh, well, Nebraska might not make a bowl game. Oh, <laughs> who would have thought of that? I mean, we saw after the. Um, 
after the Indiana game, when I said that the red flag was pretty much at the top of the pool, I said there's a good chance Nebraska loses out this season. Yeah. I said that on this show, Danny. Yes, I did. said that, and you were agreeing with me because there's a chance, and look at it. We're, I didn't think it was a high chance, but I thought there was a chance. I thought it was a pretty decent chance. The U- I said the UCLA game was the game to be circling on the calendar. If Nebraska loses that game, mm-hmm. we're in crisis mode. And Nebraska's in crisis mode right now, and that's why you just saw them switch their offensive coordinator. Are we, you, at, you don't are, just, we, are we at DEFCON 1? They're at DEFCON 1. You saw Matt Rule after the on the Monday press conference after the UCLA game. He looked like a guy that, like, I don't want to say he had no answers, but he was just like, I don't know what's going on. Like, that's literally what he was kind of portraying was he's like, he's, he was kind of throwing his hands up. Like, he's like, like, if I knew how to fix this, I'd fix it. But I don't know how to fix it. So now he went and changed offensive co- went and changed his offensive coordinator. That's one thing he knew he probably could fix. But is that going to fix it and give Nebraska one more win? We don't know. The offense, the offense could look worse if you bring in a new offensive coordinator. Mm-hmm. The, the team doesn't know what they're doing with the new playbook or what whatever they're doing. I don't know if they're going to be changing all their plays or whatever. But like, the offense could look worse. I mean, that that's a possibility. And that's something we are going to have to wait and see on Saturday. It's going to be very interesting, Danny. It's going to be very I, interesting. I, this USC game is so interesting because I, I really don't see Nebraska be able to beat Wisconsin at home. Like, that just seems like a really tough game. And then it's always tough to beat Iowa at Iowa. Nebraska shown they can't do it over the past few years. But this is a Matt Rule team, so... And time will only tell. We all agreed, though. We don't. Think we we all we all winning. we all agreed. I guarantee you, though, one of the editors chooses Nebraska in this game. I bet it. I bet it's Big Ben. I, I, it might be the other. Ben. <laughs> it, it, it might be the other Ben. Well, this was a, a very entertaining show today. We got to a lot, especially in crossover season. Thanks, thank you, Woo. thank you to all of you who watched and listened. We'll be back on Wednesday. We got some volleyball things to discuss as they just went on a. Uh, four game win streak on the road and swept every game that they play. I, I won't Woo! be on that. Danny doesn't allow me to be on. No, Ben Ben only gets one one show a week yeah, and we'll I get Anna. <laughs> we'll we'll get ready for men's basketball that night. Women's basketball will be playing the day before. So we'll have a lot to do on Wednesday. Thank you both for being here. Lots of fun. Thank you, Danny. Always fun. Thank you for watching it on you- last. It's always a blast. Thank you for watching on YouTube. Thank you for listening on Spotify or Apple. And we will see you next time.